So I'm Maria, I'm a Greek, but I'm married to a Palestinian, so I live in the Holy Land. But a way a Greek gets to Palestine is, um, I was born in Tripoli, Greece, and my parents brought me to this country, like most immigrants, for better educational opportunities, financial opportunities. So I grew up in Denver, Colorado from the time I was five years old. And uh, everything was Greek in our lives, because we'd go only to the Greek church, we'd go only to the Greek market, we'd have a Greek doctor, a Greek lawyer, Everything Greek was holy and great. And so uh, being in a very strict home, you're supposed to only leave your home when uh, uh, you get married. Then you go to your husband's home from your father's home. But uh, thank God there's a Greek Orthodox college, Hellenic College. And so I tried to convince my parents if everything Greek is great, then I should have permission to go to this Hellenic College instead of living at home and commuting to the Denver College. And so my parents were convinced that uh, Greek college would be okay, but it was my fate. I met the only non-Greek young man that was at the <laughs> Greek college. My husband, David, uh, who was studying from our village of Taibe, where, where, where we live now, and this is what I wanted to show you, our life there and our struggle to survive under difficult circumstances. But we did go back during peaceful times. Uh, we returned during the Oslo Agreement in the early 1993s in, in front of the uh, White House, House lawn. The Israelis and the Palestinians, they signed the Oslo Agreement. We really believed that Muslims, Christians, Jews, they would live uh, side by side. So we went back, very promising time. My husband never became a priest. He worked two jobs to get a master's in business instead of take the free scholarship that he had at Holy Cross. Uh, so he ha has a master in business and he boosted the economy by starting a beer business in the Middle East. But uh, I wanted to tell you that um, maybe if we start the slides, I currently live in the only uh, Christian village that exists in the West Bank. Before the creation of Israel, before 1948, we had many such places, many such all Christian locations, but because of the creation of Israel, more than four, uh, 500 villages had to be raised from the map, destroyed, demolished in order to make way for the creation of Israel. And more than 750,000 Palestinians ran away um, at gunpoint to save their lives during the times of war uh, in 1948. And so uh, because of the wars, because of the checkpoints, because of the terrible occupation policies, our Christian uh, presence is constantly diminishing. Like in Jerusalem, we had 5,000 Greeks, for example, in uh, 1948. Now we're barely 200 Greeks uh, in Jerusalem because people are just being pushed out uh, from the violence that constantly happens. Uh, so I live in Taibe. It's the only all-Christian village that exists in the Holy Land. It's a, a half an hour drive outside of Jerusalem, 15 minutes drive from Ramallah, but I can't get to Ramallah in 15 minutes because the Israeli settlers, as a punishment in 2000, shut our road down. I have to go the backward roads. It takes about 45 minutes. In 2001, it was taking an hour and 45 minutes, but now they try to fix it. So um, it would be less than 45 minutes. But uh, I am north of Jerusalem, a, a half an hour. Now, my village is well known in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. We had uh, the biblical name Ephraim. It is known as the village for receiving Jesus. Right before Jesus was crucified, he wanted to escape from the Jewish community, so he came into our village, Ephraim. We took on the new name, Taibe, because Salah Din, the Islamic leader, when he came, the local Christians always practiced the gospel of love. Love your neighbor, love your enemy. So they fed his horses even after he conquered them. They fed his soldiers, so he made a comment, you are Taibin, in Arabic means you are good people. So we uh, took on the name Taibe since the uh, 12th century after Salah Din, and we dropped the name Ephraim. But St. Helen, when she was in Jerusalem looking for the true cross, and she spent two years looking for the true cross, the local Christians must have told her that Jesus was received here, and we feel this is the reason she built the first church in our village uh, named after St. George. 
um, because uh, the people told her Jesus was received here. And she also built the Holy Nativity Church in Bethlehem and the Holy Sepulcher, of course, in Jerusalem. And, and uh, all of the major churches really in the Holy Land are attributed to St. Helen. Um, so our village has these pure, deep roots, yeah. 2,000 years of Christian presence. And we're mentioned yeah. in the Old Testament by our Aramaic name, Ephraim, our Hebrew name, Ophra, more than, more than 11 times. But in the New Testament, we're mentioned in the Gospel of John 11, verse 54, as the place where Jesus went to with his disciples right before his crucifixion, right before he had the glorious entry into Jerusalem. Now, out of the 5 million Palestinians that live in the West Bank and Gaza, we're less than 2% uh, Christian people. So our numbers are even going uh, lower. We live next to 6 million Israelis. Uh, 5 million are Jewish people. A little over one million are Palestinian Arab people that did not flee in 1948. Um, our patron saint in our village is St. George. He's the most beloved saint actually in the whole Middle East because many buildings and church buildings were protected when they saw an icon of St. George. The invaders were too scared to knock it down. He's very reverenced in the Islamic faith as well as a courageous war army uh, hero. Uh, but he's our patron saint. We have less than 2,000 people living in our village of Taiba. This is our church building that we pray in today. St. George was built by my husband's grandfather, who was the parish priest. And uh, it was renovated in 205 with that new gate and the bell tower just to give work to people because we have 60% unemployment. Our parish priest has the same name as my husband, Father David Khoury. Daoud is the Arabic name for David. He's our, our first cousin. My husband is the mayor. Uh, because every firstborn son gets the grandfather's name. So we actually have like four uh, or five David de Curies. The biggest celebrated event in our village is Palm Sunday and also receiving the miracle of the Holy Fire where everyone ecumenically marches in the streets uh, to celebrate and to witness uh, for Christ. The majority of uh, the Christians in the Holy Land tend to be Orthodox, but many other denominations are very good at giving um, humanitarian services. So our Orthodox churches are empty and many people pray in other denominations. We also have a Roman Catholic church in our village. It's called the Latin church. We use the term Latin. We also have a Melkite church. We use the word Greek Catholic to describe Melkite practice. All three churches run schools and Muslims and Christians go to school together. It's a big service that the Christian institutions give. This is a small chapel up on the hill. This is the view from my kitchen window. It's built by a French monk, but it's not used because people are scared to travel to us. My husband, David Khoury, became the first democratically elected mayor in May 2005. And since then, we've been trying to find creative ways to survive there. One way is to use our good name of Taiba beer that people know, the brewery, and bring them to the village for an Oktoberfest. And when they come, they end up buying oil and embroidery and soap and uh, all of the local goods, honey, uh, that the women cooperatives make. We have five women cooperatives and a few small businesses, and they can't take their products out because we're under severe closure. A lot of checkpoints, 300 checkpoints all around me, and we live behind a huge big wall, all paid by American taxpayers' money, in case you didn't know. Uh, we have two small uh, uh, guest homes that people can overnight for about $20 or 25 at the new one. People can overnight in Taibe. We have many historic buildings. We have 248 abandoned buildings. So another project that we were successful to bring into our village is a $300,000 grant from the Spanish government renovating 69 of these uh, abandoned homes and it preserved the beauty of the Palestinian architecture and again gave work to people during 60 percent uh, unemployment. Um, so we live in a situation where constantly we can't survive unless we bring money in for projects and thank God during my husband's leadership and I hope it's going to be finished but there's the elections have been canceled three times we've been trying to create work for people so Taibe has been under Israeli military occupation since 1967 as all of the West Bank what that means is we have no freedom of movement and all around us are little houses like the ones on top of this mountain where they're illegal Israeli settlements. These domes are an Israeli military post to see the whole area. And the illegal Israeli settlements, the way that they are a huge obstacle to peace is they control all the roads, so we can't get on the roads to get to Jerusalem unless we have a permit. 
And these Israeli settlements are getting water seven days a week, 24 hours a day. But in our village of Taibe, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the water is shut off four days a week. And the settlements have water 24 hours, seven days a week. It's a complete, pure injustice just to shut off the water on Palestinian villages. Um, Taibe is also famous for its olive trees and since 2000 because of the closure people have returned to harvest the <laughs> olive trees and that's why it was a huge big destruction that the Israeli army has uprooted more than one million olive trees in Palestine so it's not only a huge destruction to Palestinian livelihood because they can't sell the olives to survive but also to mother nature some of these trees are 700 years old 900 years old so it's a huge destruction to the earth to uproot the olive trees um, these are just some artifacts that we use, that were used in the old days to press the olives. Um, and since um, 2000, my family has diversified from bottling Taiba beer. We also bottle Taiba olive oil to help the farmers get the oil out. So this is what our beer looks like, Taiba beer. It made history in Palestine. It's the first micro-brewed beer in the whole Middle East. My husband, David, and my brother-in-law, Nadim, Hellenic College graduates returned to their home in Palestine to boost the economy. Since then, my daughter Elena and my niece Medis ha have also graduated from uh, Hellenic College. And this is what the olive oil bottle looks on the left in Taibe. And on the right, that's the oil available in France. We send it out in huge big barrels and they bottle it at a handicap center and sell it at fair trade supermarkets in France. So we are in the highest mountain region of Palestine. It's very beautiful because on one side I see the lights of Jerusalem and on the other side I can see the lights of Amman, Jordan. And right down below me where Mary of Egypt spent more than 40 years of her life in the Jordan Valley, I can see the Jordan Valley from my village. We are in Biblical Judea, if you look at a map. It's where Biblical Judea finishes and Biblical Samaria starts. Um, there, the Greek Orthodox Patriarch is the biggest landowner in all of Israel and all of Palestine so we asked for land in 1998 to be turned over to our church so we can help families that don't have homes do not own land to help them have their first affordable home so a committee was set up my father-in-law who was very instrumental to get the land turned over to the church got very ill and passed away so I, I lost my job in 2000 working in schools and teaching teachers um, upgraded strategies in the classroom. So I began to volunteer my time to the church for this housing project to help young families that get married have affordable housing. Most people get married and they move in with their mother-in-law and their father-in-law. So this gives them their own space to start their families and it um, upgrades their living conditions. So although my church needed 90 homes, I was not successful to raise the million dollars that they needed, but 145,000 that we raised uh, from churches across the country helped us start the project. So in August 205, we began uh, to build on uh, the land still owned by the Patriarchate, but the people have permission by Jordanian uh, real estate laws to live there for life. And on top, they, their children, children can build uh, to stay as a family. So we only finished 14 skeleton units. This is what uh, the skeleton unit looks like. There's a house on the left and a house on the, uh, on the right. So we had started with 14, and now as funds are raised, we have gotten up to 18 homes. But because we can't ever raise enough funds to finish the whole house, we start a foundation for families, and they're supposed to put in their own kitchens and their own bathrooms so they could move in. We have three families that have finished their home and are, are, are moving in. We found that that's a way to keep the project going instead of uh, stopping the fundraising. Not only do we suffer under Israeli military occupation, we also suffer from fanaticism. And these were 14 different homes that were burned down in September 205 because a Muslim family was very angry at a Christian family. And so they came to burn the man's house down and everyone that was related to him. I was house number 15. I was very blessed my home was saved. It took six hours for the Israeli army to give the permission to the Palestinian police to come from. Again, I told you we have no freedom of movement. It means also emergency services can't come to us unless they have the permission of the army. So if the army gave them permission before the six hours, maybe they would have saved the, seven, the first home or the second home. Uh, that was just a picture of an Israeli uh, checkpoint. This is what the wall looks like. It's 26 feet high closes Bethlehem all the way in. Bethlehem is a huge prison. My area, another prison. 
up north in Janine closed in another so we have a bunch of little different prison camps really what it is and these conditions are forcing people to move that you can't live under conditions where it's 60 percent unemployment and you're constantly closed in and you need a piece of paper to go to the airport to go to the hospital to go to Jerusalem to pray anything so the green is what Palestine was before 1948 and you can see with the creation of Israel and with the Zionist policies to make 100% Jewish homeland, the green is disappearing from the map, and, and the white is what is Israel. And um, we ask for people, please pray for us that we survive there as a small little Christian community because we have deep roots, 2,000 years since the time of the birth of Christ. And uh, we ask people to connect to us. Come and visit. See with your own eyes what is happening in the Holy Land and then become active. Let your local representatives and senators know because $7 million a day goes to Israel to keep up this occupation and to keep up this wiping out a whole ethnic group, the Palestinians. And $7 million a day could be better used in this country instead of weapons and keeping up this occupation. Um, and also we ask people to connect to us and if they can't help us financially during the Lenten seasons when they are helping other worthy causes to put the Holy Land on their list and my campaign was that if each person would give a dollar to their church and even if it took two Lenten uh, seasons if a church raised a thousand dollars it would take 50 churches <coughs> to build one home because when we started the building it would cost fifty thousand dollars to build one home but now the value of the dollar has dropped and also the price of cement and steel has gone way up so it's actually costing more but our partner, and this is an ongoing project, is the metropolis of Boston, uh, Metropolitan Methodios. And so uh, anyone that likes to help with this, it's an ongoing project, can, can continue to help. So in, uh, I work in three ways in my village with the village festival. It helps create jobs for people. I've done six successful festivals in Taibé. Uh, they have, the Taibé <coughs> Oktoberfest has become a major event in Palestine, we had 24 ambassadors and council generals that came to the opening of uh, the Oktoberfest uh, last year. So we constantly <coughs> ask for solidarity and support so we can continue to stay there as a little community because Israel is just simply trying to wipe us out uh, from day to day uh, um, miserable situations on the ground. Because really, I'm living in Taibe, it's a Palestinian point. I want to go to Ramallah, it's a Palestinian point. In 2001, when I was taking my children to school, five checkpoints to get there. And it's, as I mentioned, a 15-minute ride, but the roads are shut down from the settlers, so you can only use the backward roads, the roads that have holes, the roads that have rocks, the roads that are too steep, too dangerous to drive in the wintertime, but that's the only way to get to school. And so it's a pure injustice. You pass the first checkpoint, the second, you can even see the school. So when that soldier says, you can't pass, this is a military road, uh, it takes all of Christ's love in your heart to tell that soldier, God protect you today, or God bless you. And I have my son on the other side, he's punching me out. He says, Mom, don't you think you want to curse him? Don't you want to say, God, take you away? He's, you know, stopping us from going to school. And each and every day I'm challenged to share my Christian values uh, and traditions, a simple thing, love your neighbor, love your enemy, and to treat people peacefully when every single day you're being violated from your basic human rights. And um, I just want to finish because Father David said I only have 15 minutes, so <laughs> forgive me, I'm talking fast. Um, another project I'm working on is through my books with our sister church in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, we've set up an education endowment fund so we could use the interest to help students go to college there locally at Bethlehem University or Brzee University or even at the YMCA to become uh, secretaries. But uh, we're moving this project from the Norfolk Church, possibly to the Little Rock Annunciation Church. But again, dollar, dollar, this was nothing. And we have $50,000 as an endowment fund um, with the Taiba Education uh, Fund uh, in Norfolk, Virginia. And like I said, we're trying now to find a church that's willing to invest it for us, like in secured CDs. At that time, when we started in 206, um, a four, uh, like a 4% interest rate could pay for someone to go to college. Our college tuition is less than $2,000 a year at Brzee University or Bethlehem University, nothing like 50000 here at Harvard, where my nephew is. But um, still, $2,000, people look at it as it is $50,000 because they simply have no incoming income. Um, so these are just some 
small projects to express love for my neighbor where I live because I literally went from a fast-paced beautiful city like Boston to the middle of nowhere and you could kind of like go crazy so uh, giving my time and efforts to the church um, has helped me keep uh, my sanity about day-to-day -day struggle uh, how difficult it is to live there I think the Holy Cross uh, bookstore has maybe the last four copies but I do have the other side of the picture which is Christina goes to the Holy Land I was sick and tired of people saying we can't come to you it's too dangerous so I wanted to put a little seed in children's mind that still there's a beauty in the Holy Land where Jesus was born where Jesus was uh, uh, resurrected crucified and resurrected where the miracle of the Holy Fire continues to happen every year at the Holy Tomb at the same place at the same time on Holy Saturday it's such a shame if the patriarch comes out he says Christ is risen we don't have any local Christians to say truly the Lord is risen because people can come from all over the world to see this beautiful miracle but if you're a Christian and you're only 15 minutes away in Bethlehem or 25 minutes away in Tibet you need a piece of paper you need a permit to go there so uh, Christina goes to the Holy Land just walks the footsteps of Christ and promotes our Christian presence in, in, in the Holy Land as a part of an effort to put a seed in children's mind to pray for peace and stability in the Holy Land so people can continue to come and walk the footsteps of Christ and be enriched by the spiritual journey. Um, I thank you so much for staying uh, extra, and I know everyone is on a busy schedule, so I'm happy to take uh, a question if, uh, if uh, Father David would allow questions. But um, And I'm going to leave all the books in the bookstore in case anyone wants to buy any, but I, I do have, because Father David was generous and nice to say he'll, he'll keep them here, so you don't have to purchase them today unless you want them autographed. Yes? Is it possible that our congressmen and senators and uh, your United States knows about what's going on between well, the Holy Land and Israel? You know, I'm glad you said that because here the media controls what people know. In other words, you will notice on ABC, NBC, CBS, <clears throat> you will never hear the word Israeli military occupation. This is the way that I live and I live like that day to day under guns and under Israel. You will never hear this word because Israel is always brought near and dear to every American living room. And you will never hear the word illegal Israeli settlement, which are these homes built in the West Bank in only 22% of Palestine. The second state solution is that where I am, it's only 22% of historic Palestine that we want to have freedom in and call it Palestine. So in this 22%, half a million Jewish people are trying to settle it take the water seven days a week, 24 hours a day, control the road so they could just squeeze us in, squeeze us in until they wipe us out. So the senators and the representatives aren't getting the real news. And $7 million a day of American taxpayers' money goes to Israel. That's more money per Israeli citizen since 1948 benefits than the three programs in this country, which is Social Security, the, the grants and the health care. This is, this is a terrible that so much money is blindly sent to Israel. This is a museum which traces the, the path of orthodoxy, the journey of orthodoxy to America. Um, it was established to, to show the, the roots of the Orthodox Church in America. Now, this museum was set up by Father John Parrish, and um, the initial entry point has an uh, exhibit of various um, artifacts, costumes, uh, cultural traditions of different peoples who have 
came to America and it represents Ellis Island, which was the, the entry point for many of the people who did come to America, especially at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, when most of the Orthodox people came to America. The section on Alaska uh, shows some of the, the artifacts, cultural artifacts and traditions of the Alaskan native people, the Eskimos, the Aleuts, the Indians. St. Tichon's Monastery is the oldest Orthodox monastery in America. It was founded in 1905, and it's in the, the village of South Canaan in uh, northeastern Pennsylvania. The founder of our monastery, St. Tichon uh, of Moscow, Patriarch of Moscow, uh, and founded this monastery in 1905, his, uh, his Montia, when he was uh, Metropolitan of Moscow, is here in the monastery. Um, similarly, we have vestments from um, St. Nikolai of Zicha, the Serbian bishop who um, was rector of the seminary. The uh, section on showing the celebration of the Lenten Holy Supper uh, prior to the celebration of the, the vigil service for the nativity of, of our Lord Jesus Christ um, shows what a typical um, home in Karpatha, Russia or in the Ukraine uh, might look like prior to that um, Holy Supper meal. The family would share together before going to church. If people are interested, and they're certainly welcome, we, we have this exhibit here be, because um, we want to share th these things. The Icon uh, Repository was built in 1995. It was a gift to the seminary by Mr. John Guzzi. It was um, built behind the old monastery bell tower. It's a collection of icons, 400 icons in it, the collection, uh, many from Russia, uh, many from the 19th century, but there are also some from the 17th century, from the 18th century, and there are also from other countries, from Greece, Romania, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia. Um, there are two icons from uh, uh, Syria, from Dalmatia. Is a Coptic icon, so it's it's quite a varied collection, and uh, the oldest icon is from the 15th century. There are also 17th century, 18th century icons. One of the uh, items in the exhibit is a gospel book that was given by the first Romanov Tsar Michael to a monastery for women in Russia, and that was um, dates back to 1636. That many non-Orthodox people have come to see the collection because they're interested in icons or or um, liturgical works from uh, that those periods of time to those countries, and so they've come to visit the collection, and we're able to introduce them to the Orthodox faith. It's an impressive collection. We've had priests come from Russia, and they've been impressed. They said, then, other than in large state museums, there are very few places, even in Russia, we have uh, this concentration of, of icons. Uh, we've had um, classes from local universities and colleges, and um, even from high schools, the Russian studies classes or art classes. Um, so it's a resource that people have come um, and it's really an evangelical tool in that sense that many non-Orthodox people have come to see the collection because they're interested in icons or, or um, liturgical works from uh, that, those periods of time to those countries. And so they've come to visit the collection and we're able to introduce them to the Orthodox faith. So it's best to make an appointment uh, when would one would want to come and so we can arrange a time of mutual convenience so someone could show you uh, the museum and, and explain things to you. Mm -hmm.